guys. So today we are reading an episode from the Mammoth Book of Cover-Ups, and today's article is called The Face on Mars. Some of you might be familiar with the image that NASA released um, first in the 70s, I believe, and then I think it was re-released to uh, downplay the uh, facial features of this particular uh, structure that they had photographed in the 70s, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, part of the reason that it uh, became, I guess, a uh, cover-up was the fact that the original pictures really had a significant humanoid image, and afterwards, the ones that were taken, I think, either in the 90s or the early 2000s, um, look, uh, didn't look like anything, and so then the the idea was that NASA was trying to hide some sort of um, alien civilization or, or structure or whatever it was. So let's see what this um, particular uh, cover-up article talks about, and then I'll get into a couple of other things. Um, I am using screenshots today because I'm using a slightly different app, so I'm just going to be moving it along with, um, it'll just be moving up as we go along. So the title is Face on Mars. Humans are gregarious creatures, so it's no wonder we're uncomfortable with the idea of being all alone in the universe. Science has yet to conclusively prove that we are other than an insignificant anomaly in the grand scheme of things, so we can't be blamed for getting a little bit excited when what seems to be proof of the existence of neighborhood aliens comes along. On the 25th of July, 1976, the craft Viking Orbiter 1 was busy acquiring images of the Sidonia region of Mars in search of potential landing sites for Viking Lander 2. Its pictures of the Martian landscape revealed exciting geological formations, a mixture of plains and mesas and butts, which are large, rocky outcrops familiar to the American Southwest. But what the NASA scientists could not have expected to see was a giant face staring back at them from the planet's surface. The photograph was not released immediately as the scientists believed it was nothing but an amusing coincidence. It was not until the image was rediscovered by Vincent de Pietro and Gregory Molinar, two engineers at the Goddard Space Fly Flight Center, that the rest of the world had the opportunity to view this remarkable phenomenon. The grainy images appeared to show a humanoid face with deep-set eyed sockets and a narrow nose, as well as half of a thin, unsmiling mouth. Deep shadows obscured the other half of the face, but to the viewer, the features appeared to be perfectly symmetrical. The structure itself was over 1.5 miles long by 1 mile wide. than anything which is larger than anything built on earth nevertheless once the photograph was broadcast people quickly identified a resemblance between the martian face and those of ancient egyptian pharaohs or of the sphinx at giza nasa however solid stole stolidly maintain that it was by mere chance this particular hill resembled a face and attempted to downplay the whole matter. Those who believed the hill was artificial began to look for other clues to support their hypothesis. One was Richard C. Hoagland, a regular science correspondent on a radio talk show in Florida, who became convinced that the face was part of a complex of other structures visible to the Viking pictures, including a fortress, an artificial cliff, a five 
sided pyramid and a collection of rocky forms dubbed the City Square. He went on to write a book about the subject and began a campaign to force NASA to admit that it was covering up the true nature of the discoveries. Debate began to rage about who would have built the monuments. Given the resemblance to Egyptian architecture, had a race of long-dead Martians visited the earth and constructed similar monuments. A few that seemed to be to jibe nicely for those who had always maintained aliens at a hand in the building of the pyramids. And if the aliens had achieved that, what else could they have been responsible for? Where had human civilization, or more dramatic still, human life really began? begun? The implications for human history seemed enormous, and yet the scientific community continued to refuse to take the issue seriously. It seemed the scientists had a vested interest in keeping the Martian civilization theory under wraps. The suspicion of a cover-up appeared to be confirmed when missions to Mars, this time with a camera aboard capable of taking high-resolution photographs that could pick out objects the size of a small airplane clearly on the planet's surface, but that the face would not be one of them. NASA argued it had more pressing scientific priorities elsewhere at the time on and the camera's abilities were limited. It was soon forced by public outcry to reconsider. To reconsider its plans. The face had been capturing people's imagination for over 20 years, and they wanted to know once and for all whether it was artificial. NASA backed down, and on the 5th of April 1998, the Mars Orbiter camera re-photographed the face. Anticlimactically, the new pictures confirmed what scientists had been saying all along. The face was just a lumpy, rather uninteresting hill. In the new photographs, there was no sign of any facial features at all. All of its dimensions, in fact, are similar to other mesas. It's not exotic in any way, commented Jim Garvin, a NASA Mars scientist. The believers in sentient life on Mars did not give up their dream so easily, however. The camera had taken the pictures during the Martian winter, they said. Wispy cloud was obscuring the detail and making the image appear unnaturally flat. Not only that, NASA had doctored the photos to cover up the presence of an alien civilization on Mars. Once again, NASA bowed to public pressure, and a second pass was made over the Sidonia region in April of 2001, this time during the Martian summer. These photographs appear startlingly clear, considering the distance from which they are taken, and once again show an ordinary mess of formation, complete with fissures and cracks and no symmetrical features at all. This conclusion was backed up by evidence from the Mars Global Surveyor onboard laser uh, altimetry equipment capable of measuring planetary features to within a foot, which delineated a rocky outcrop, not an alien-made structure. The same was true of other features such as the cliff and the pyramid and the whole mystery dissolved. It's very hard to release an idea that's consumed you for a quarter of a century, and the Martian conspiracy theorists Martian conspiracy theorists carry on regardless. Some are claiming the face can still be clearly seen if only it is subjected to enough image processing. Others say NASA has released fake pictures in order to keep the uncomfortable knowledge of Martian life a secret. The rest of the world has quietly forgotten the face. Okay, so this 
this is the face on Mars and I guess this is the image from the 70s and it really does look like a face. I I can see uh, the other kinds of structures that, you know, don't resemble that, but this really looks like a pretty symmetrical face, but there is a strong shadow on it as well. Um, so this is the thing. The reason that it's for me, an interesting topic is because uh, a book that was released, a book series that was released in the 70s and I guess early 80s because it was a continuing series, uh, was written by um, Zachariah Sitchin. I can't remember if it was called the Earth Children series or, or what, what the what the Earth Chronicles, I think that was what it was called. But anyway, um, it, it's a series of books and in his, the last or latest one, um, it was a translation of a tablet that, uh, was, I guess, the alien's backstory. So, if you guys are not familiar with Zachariah Sitchin, he has, there's a lot of controversy about him as well. I mean, I could probably make a video just about his controversy, but basically, um, people who are actual Sumerian scholars say that Sitchin is not a scholar at all. He is an Israeli who, um, studied Arabic and Aramaic and a couple of other languages, but not Sumerian. And yet this person supposedly translated Sumerian tablets that are around 10,000 years old, found in Iraq and in those regions that uh, nobody could really translate before. Um, but his translation in any case was a uh, very radically different from anything that had been translated in the previous versions by actual scholars. Those scholars um, were translating stories that were more like metaphors, like a lot of the creation type stories that are found in older civilizations. But Sitchin's translation made it seem much more like a uh, soap opera. I mean, there were characters and there was uh, human engineering and there was, uh, you know, a lot of advanced technology and a lot was going on. So basically, just a quick synopsis, according to his translations, um, there was a race of humans or humanoids, people who looked like us living on another planet called Nibiru and um, they had uh, various issues going on with their climate and the leadership was also going through some sort of turmoil. The main leader at that time was named Alalu, who was then somehow got into some controversy with another ruling faction or there was some fight that went on and um, Alalu escaped the planet and in his travels uh, away from Nibiru, came across first Mars and found it to have a certain amount of mineral content. And then he also apparently discovered Earth and found it to be much more um, uh, habitable, you know, clean air and so forth, and had a, um, active animal life and so forth. And so he felt that he could reestablish himself on his own planet by then, um, you know, helping to mine the mineral content on these two, you know, newly found planets and send it back to Nibiru, who had an atmospheric issue and they required gold in order to filter out the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, to help close up some sort of gaps that were opening up in their atmosphere. So that was what uh, Alalu thought that he was going to be able to do. But the leadership that had taken over in his absence um, also wanted to be involved with this mining project. And so they sent their people over and there was then a fight on this planet. And it was according to the translations, it was a wrestling fight, and the Alalu character uh, didn't make it in that fight. And so in order to memorialize him, because he had been a former leader and he was the person who had discovered this planet and Mars, they 
according to these, uh, this translation, a face was made on Mars to memorialize him. And so they're saying that this was that face. And so this is what Sitchin claims in, uh, is translated in those tablets in the latest one. I forgot what it was called. Um, the Diary of Enki or something like that. And, uh, basically that's, that's what they're saying, what he claimed this face image was. Now, he came out with those books, probably this one came out in the 80s, I'm thinking, or late 70s in any case. So this picture had been taken in 76, so it was already of like a hot interest topic. And, and because that, if you read that story, it is such a um, soap opera of a story that it's, it's kind of an unbelievable saga. There's so many characters, so many twists and turns. It's interesting in any case, but, uh, he gave an explanation that he claimed was written in tablets that are 10,000 years old, and no one else is able to corroborate this, though. Um, so it's always, a, it's, his stuff is highly controversial. There are also videos of him doing Masonic handshakes, and you know what I mean? It's like, it's very hard to know what the deal is. Is he part of Project Bluebeam? Meaning that part of the project to pretend that there was an alien presence that is then returning and blah, blah, blah. There's like a whole possibility with him. Um, and actual Sumerian scholars say that he is mistranslated and fully made everything up is what they're saying. Um, so, you know, it's very hard to, to, to say, which if you watch his videos, he doesn't look like somebody, you know, who's going to sit there and make up so many stories. But then on the other hand, he doesn't have, uh, any training in the languages he claims to be translating either. So it's very possible that he was fed these stories and that he might be part of some uh, Masonic, you know, uh, secret society, but maybe they'd had some information and they wanted to use this little, little guy to uh, kind of divulge the information to the public. I mean, there are a lot of possibilities, but it could also be a part and parcel of the uh, blue agenda, which is to sort of like get people used to this idea of an alien civilization seeding the um, earthlings and then uh, saying that they're going to come back, which is what basically Project Bluebeam is about, but you first have to sort of get people used to this idea so that um, things started right around the late 60s, early 70s, um, fun Donegan, or I forgot his name, but it was a Swedish guy, and uh, Sitchin, they were like one of these, uh, made the two main proponents of this um, alien, ancient aliens concept, but now there's even a television show, and it's very popular, and that's that guy with the, the hair, I forgot his name, but you know, it, it's become this concept that a lot of people accept. There is some uh, very interesting points. I really do like that show, but then I saw this other video on, um, YouTube, which completely is a debunking of the ancient aliens concept as well, and that goes into great detail, too. Um, I'm not totally convinced that every single thing could not have been built by humans. It's just that we might not be aware of the techniques that they were using, and that's basically what that debunking video shows that look, the scientists that are claiming how could the humans have built a pyramid or how could they have built this and that, they explain various ways that they could have built it in ancient civilizations, that they were not that completely inept, that they actually were very skilled. And uh, so that that's a good video to the debunking one, if, if it is a debunkable concept. And this is then just maybe part of some um, extended blue beam, I, you know, uh, methodology where they slowly keep bringing up this concept so that a large number of people eventually accept it. I, I don't know what, um, how many people this resonates with in society or if they're even familiar with it, but, you know, even that um, shapeshifter, uh, possible psyop, and, you know, a couple of things that they do. It takes a couple of decades for it to sort of filter into the mainstream society, and over a period of time, a larger and larger 
larger group starts accepting it and then they can introduce new topics so this this stuff takes a couple of decades but they use various means um for starting with these like kind of alternative conspiracy theories but it's actually government uh teams <laughs> putting this stuff together so um it's it's not totally clear as far as what's going on if this is an accurate image and if nasa then doctored it later or if in fact it was made on purpose just to spur the controversy and then a guy like sitchin then comes out probably afterwards saying that oh look i found these tablets that said we made a face you know 10,000 or however many years ago we made this face to memorialize this uh, king of ours, Alalu, and it's on Mars, and oh, uh, you know, people have now a photograph that basically, um, you know, seems to corroborate the so-called uh, tablet translation, but ev everything is, is, uh, is possible, and there could also be some scamming going on, too, because there's, you know, there's a uh, this uh, blue beam idea has been around for a while, like since the, um, definitely since the 60s, but actually it was, I think, started in the 40s, where uh, the Project Paperclip scientists that had come uh, from Nazi Germany, um, von Braun and so forth, said that this is something that they were planning on doing for a while. Um, a part of some sort of Luciferian agenda to kind of get people away from the core religious, you know, doctrines and follow some new thing. I mean, I don't know. I will have to see what this long-term agenda is. I don't really think um, Bluebeam would ever be done the way that everyone thinks it'll be done, which is that aliens just show up and everyone's like, I don't think they're going to do it that way. I think it's sort of being done in this way with television shows and movies and, and just sort of kind of convincing people of a concept that they may not have thought of before. I don't know if it, there's any truth to it, but it just, you know, I think there's sort of, uh, this is the method that will be used because I just don't think, um, they're going to use, uh, you know, holograms and things that we, we are familiar with that kind of technology at this point that I don't think it would be as convincing. So they might be doing it in other ways, like, you know, that television show, if you watch Ancient Aliens, enough of it anyway, um, you do get convinced at a certain point because you have a one-sided point of view that, okay, some alien civilization created humans and they then did this, this, and this. And after a while, you do start agreeing with everything they're saying. It was only when I watched that debunking video that I realized, wow, they totally bypassed so many um, facts in this. And they, they, it was completely biased. Their evidence was completely biased in that um in that show, so watch the debunking too, even if you're into the ancient aliens, because I was told I really liked that television show. It's, I think, on Netflix if you haven't seen it, because it was a, a History Channel thing, but um, th it's possible that this is some long-term sort of concept that they're pushing. I mean, because even the Vatican came out with a statement that, uh, that they accept the possibility of aliens and stuff like, I mean, strange things like what why should the Vatican eat? It has nothing to do with this, but they have an entire, um, they have an entire committee for this, for alien disclosure at the Vatican, and they also have telescopes, at the Lucifer telescope, I mean, why is it even named that? There's, there's a lot of stuff going on that, um, is questionable, and it does seem like they're sort of wanting to get people to, um, I don't know, uh, what what the conspiracy people call it, like a one world religion I don't know if that's even possible but in order to do that they would have to get them away from the three major ones that are currently functioning and that's harder said than done because you know people have uh, a in some cases thousands of years of this information being filtered down over the centuries and it's not something that you can just let go of that quickly so then it's like decades 
decades and decades of a, a sort of hammering down of something until they can sort of introduce something new. So we'll see. I mean, look, people's point of view change changes all the time. If you look at the uh, way that people live now, the way that they want to raise their kids, this concept of like genderless kids and all of this, this was never, I mean, nobody would even believe that this was some some sort of an issue in like the 1920s or, or 30s or something just a couple of decades ago really so you know just by continually addressing something over and over again and hitting it from different angles you can change people's point of view and especially when you have television and movies it's like the greatest indoctrination devices ever um, and you can convince people of a certain concept now what the goal is, what the end goal of doing that is, we'll have to see, but uh, according to the conspiracy people, there, there are two sides of this, some, some say that they're hiding aliens and hiding the information, and the other group, a much smaller group, is saying that it's almost like a double conspiracy, that they're creating the conspiracy in order to um, sort of create this uh, second wave of... Uh, like a new religious concept, and this is how they were going to do that through this kind of blue beam methodology. So we'll have to see what it ends up being. But uh, in any case, um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And I wanted to make a, a non uh, chewing video because I know some people, you know, want just a simple reading one. And um, I needed to use this particular app because I don't think the microphone was getting picked up with the regular camera for some reason. So um, hopefully the sound is a little better, but then it might be picking up a lot more background sound too. So I don't know. We'll have to see. I will check it at the end. I hope you guys have a good